Welcome. Today, competing visions of capitalism. Will our uniquely American version sustain us or leave us way behind other nations, economically and socially? Then, life for African American New Yorkers before there was a Harlem. Now we can discover 19th century Gotham on our smartphones as we stroll through the 21st. Also today, we hear about not the high but the low line, the plan for an underground oasis where trolleys used to rumble. All this plus former Yankee All-Star Jim Bouton, who teaches us how to be really obnoxious fans. First, what kind of capitalism do you want? You can feel the question rumbling between this year's presidential contest. Mitt Romney calls the president's vision for America government-centered. Obama labels the Republican budget social Darwinism. It's simplistic name-calling, but it's part of a critical tug-of-war between the public and private sectors that's ongoing worldwide. How we strike the balance here will determine America's future, says our first guest. He is David Rothkopf, CEO and editor-at-large for Foreign Policy magazine. He has written a new book entitled Power, Inc., the epic rivalry between big business and government and the reckoning that lies ahead. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the program. My pleasure to be here. Your book includes the concept of a semi-state. What is that, and are we one now? <laughs> I don't think we are quite there. But the idea is that states uh, used to be thought of in terms of certain kinds of powers, the ability to control their borders, to print money, to project force, to enforce their laws. And over the course of the past couple of hundred years, thanks to progress and thanks to some systematic efforts to push back the role of the state, there are a lot of states now that don't actually do those things. Uh, the Internet and, and globalization have made it tougher to control borders. Uh, there are only a few countries that actually print money that you could uh, exchange elsewhere in the world. Uh, there are probably a dozen and a half countries that could project force and sustain a war for more than a couple of days. Uh, and in terms of enforcing laws, uh, because corporations are global and states are local, uh, it's possible for corporations to actually play states against one another to venue shop to say, I'm not going to pay those taxes, I'll go someplace else. And so it's become harder even to enforce laws. There are probably 150 out of 190 or so countries that fall within the definition of semi-states if you define it to mean that, you know, two or three or four of those things that I just described apply to your state. So that's the decline of state power vis-a-vis -vis corporations. You also have a concept called super citizen. Does that apply to individuals? Well, I suppose there are a few individuals that uh, sort of, you know, creep up to that level. Uh, but really, it applies to corporations, because in the sense that corporations were originally created to be immortal, uh, you know, so that one could conduct economic affairs even after owners died, uh, that gives them one advantage that we clearly don't have. Uh, then gradually over time, legal rulings, particularly legal rulings in the, other, in, in the United States, have really empowered corporations to not only have a lot of the rights that, that, that we have, there have been five Supreme Court rulings, or, uh, or, or there have been Supreme Court rulings that have granted them five of the ten rights to, to enumerated in the Bill of Rights, uh, but there, there have also been uh, 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 other factors that contribute to their super citizenship. They've gotten very, very big. There are probably 2,000 corporations in the world that have economic resources greater than the smallest uh, 50 or 80 countries. Uh, uh, they also have political rights in some places, like the United States, that people don't have. Uh, uh, Citizens United essentially said that the government can't regulate how much companies spend on on political campaigns, which means that they get to spend more, they have more of the right of free speech of, than all of us do, uh, and so on. And so you have giant, immortal uh, entities with special rights that are designed to operate globally, while we ordinary people end up being citizens within countries, sometimes citizens within countries that themselves are only semi-states. So you have, in the big sweep of history, the idea that basically socialism is dead, Marxism is dead, and the battle in this century is going to be between different forms of capitalism. 
Do I have that right? And if so, where does the United States version today fit in? Well, I think you have that right. I think, you know, at the end of uh, the Cold War, we did a bit of a victory dance and said it's all been resolved. It's the end of history. Wahoo! And America has won. And, of course, I don't think that's really what happened. The, the United States uh, had a moment there of uh, being the sole superpower. The French called us the hyperpower, and our system was the system against which, well, all others was measured. Then, in rapid succession, we did damage to ourselves with our involvement in the Middle East, uh, and did, uh, in some ways, uh, particularly with regard to this issue, even more grievous damage with the financial crisis and with the revelation that our system was becoming more unequal, that social inequality was falling, that we weren't actually creating jobs, that median incomes were falling. And as all of that was happening, other countries that approached capitalism in other ways were doing better. Germany was creating more jobs, had a bigger social safety net, uh, China was growing faster. Brazil and India were growing faster. And you look around and you saw that whether you're talking about European capitalism, particularly the capitalism in Northern Europe, or capitalism with Chinese characteristics, or uh, democratic development capitalism in India and Brazil, or the capitalism of small entrepreneurial states like the UAE or Israel or uh, Singapore, that while they were all different, they all had one thing in common that was different from us, which is they all counted on a bigger role for the state, whether it was the state helping to make the country more competitive, the state being more involved in providing health care or social safety net, uh, the state uh, 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 being a more clear-cut partner of businesses. They were buying in to a different balance between the corporate world and the the, and the public sector than we were. Um, did you hear about the Yale University faculty voting to express concern last week that Yale is opening a branch in Singapore? Singapore, the idea is that Western liberal uh, education with freedom of thought may not be compatible with the kind of government that they have over there even though some Americans hold up Singapore as a model? Well, you know, I don't think any of the models that I've just described are models that are without flaws. And clearly, Singapore has uh, got some issues with regard to democracy and with regard to free expression of thought. Uh, that said, there are a lot of Western institutions that want to be active in Singapore, uh, that admire what's being done there economically, uh, and that recognize that one of the realities of the global era is that different values are being brought to bear. And I think, you know, one of the things that's hard for us in the U.S., most of whom have been raised with the idea that uh, we're, the, we're the light to the world and it's our example um, that really ought to be followed by everybody else, is that prior to the American example, there was the European example when that was the center of gravity. Uh, and now the center of economic gravity is shifting to Asia. And whether we like it we don't like it, the, the reality is that's going to make them have an advantage in kind of the global marketplace of ideas. And uh, whether it's the Chinese or the Singaporeans or the Indians or, you know, uh, I, uh, versions of capitalism practice elsewhere, uh, we're going to have to get used to the fact that uh, our values may not uh, win the day. Are we seeing a new chapter in the relationship between um, economic freedom, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and political freedom. Uh, we like to think in this country that democracy and capitalism are intertwined with one another, but that's clearly not the case in China, despite how successful they've been recently at capitalism. Um, it's clearly not the case in, in China. One might argue it's clearly not the case here. Uh, if big corporations have the ability to contribute as much money as they want to a political system that is entirely dependent on money in order for candidates to be selected or to determine whether they're victorious or not, uh, that's not very democratic either. Uh, we may condemn the Indians or, 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 or countries in Africa for corruption within their systems, uh, but, you know, we have a form of white-collar corruption here. Uh, with regard to lobbyists, with regard to revolving doors, 
uh, even President Obama, who's been quite outspoken on these issues, has seen something like half of the big bundlers who contributed to his campaign or raised money for it end up in his government in top government roles. So, uh, you know, it, but, are there but does that go to, does that go too far? Because it sounds like you're stating a kind of moral equivalency between the United States and China with respect to the amount of democracy <clears throat> and whatever the problems with our campaign finance system and so forth. Do you mean to put the two on about the same plane? No, not at all. I, I, you know, I mean, clearly, we're more democratic. Clearly, our system uh, works better. Clearly, we have a history of creating more opportunities. Clearly, in terms of our foreign policy, we are willing to stand up for values worldwide. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm trying to say, however, is that before we get up on our high horse and are dismissive of them at this particular point in their path to development, we ought to recognize that we are living in a house, if not entirely made of glass, that it's got a lot of exposed glass surfaces. Do you think that the rise of, <clears throat> the, rise of the Internet uh, mitigates any of this anywhere? Well, sure. I mean, the Internet is a factor that, you know, empowers large groups of people out there. Uh, uh, grassroots power, whether it was the campaign a number of years ago to uh, uh, stop the spread of landmines or, or the ability that uh, protesters in Tahrir Square had to organize using uh, the Internet and social media, uh, that, that's a helpful democratizing force. Having said that, strangely enough, uh, big actors, big corporate actors in particular, are the ones that are benefiting the most from the Internet and are using it. And it's not exactly like, you know, Google or Apple or Microsoft are thought of as, uh, you know, those kind of soft, cuddly, inspiring, geek-led uh, garage enterprises that we, we sometimes like to think of the Internet as being. Do you think that this, <coughs> excuse me, that this tension in the presidential election this year is pivotal to the future of the United States? Well, you know, I think we all suffer from a, a, a disease which, which, which you might call temporal narcissism, which is we all think our moment in history is the most important moment, and politicians tend to compound this. I don't think I've ever lived through an election where a politician said, this is one of the least consequential elections of our lifetime. Um, that it's always the most important one. Uh, but interestingly, I think, in terms of this election, uh, despite the fact that politicians say that it's the most pivotal election in history, it's really quite important because you've got a Republican Party that's essentially advocating the policy of the past 30 or 40 years of both parties, which is to leave it to the markets. Uh, the markets will take care of themselves. Uh, and the president beginning for the first time in recent memory to start saying, what about fairness? What about the 99%? What about this inequality? What about faltering social mobility in the United States? Shouldn't we push back on it? I don't think he's done it as dramatically as he could have or as other candidates might, but I do think that this discussion is going to be central to our future. And at the same time, while we are looking inward at ourselves during this election, the world is changing very, very rapidly. And if we don't sort of you know, get, get, get with the program, start figuring out how we can compete, start figuring out how public-private partnerships can work in our future as they have in our past with the building of canals or railroads or the Internet or much of the technological innovation that came out of the space program, then we are going to fall further and further behind, uh, much as we have been in terms of relative economic strength for the past couple of decades. Can you talk more about, <clears throat> about the idea of public-private partnerships? I think you put part of the uniqueness of the American version of capitalism right there, don't you? Yeah, and I think it's been a great strength of the United States and uh, one that I think we have uh, minimized to our detriment over the course of the period since, say, the Reagan-Thatcher revolution of the early 1980s, the Milton Friedman revolution of the early 1980s because it was the public sector working together with the private sector that knit America together, whether it was with canals or with railroads or with the highway system that was put in place. 
it was the public sector working with the private sector that helped fund uh, the development of radar, the development of GPS satellites, the development of uh, the internet, the development of a lot of the technologies that have given us the edge, a lot of computing technologies, uh, even the things that we think of as the most quintessentially private sector, like uh, venture capitalism. Uh, well, a lot of venture capitalism was essentially funded uh, by programs created during the Eisenhower administration to leverage up small businesses and technological advantages uh, so that we could help compete with the Soviets. Do you have a line that, <clears throat> that you draw uh, where the optimal relationship is in our last minute or so between the public and the private sectors? Well, there's no line. It, I think what we have to do is move away from dogma, as you said in the introduction. We have to move away from the Orwellian four legs good, two legs bad, cartoonish arguments that we've had. When government can help, it should help. When government can help, it should do it efficiently, and it should step back when it's doing something that the private sector can do well. When the private sector needs help and when social justice warrants it, then we have to have the public sector at the table. We need a balance. Right now, we're not even having an honest discussion about what that balance ought to be. Thank you very much for having some of that discussion here. I appreciate it. Up next, the untold story of African-American New Yorkers in the 1800s. It was the best and worst of times. Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. To find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY leads. CUNY leads to the career I always wanted. Uh, Mom, I'm not going to go to college. What are you saying? You've got to go to college. Well, they offered me a job and... Son, college is much more important. No. Yes. No, Mom. Yes. Anyways, it's my decision. Okay, well then decide what degree you're going to get because you will go to college. Their tomorrow depends on your words today. The Hispanic Scholarship Fund has the information you need to help your kids go to college. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. We know about today, but what was life like for African Americans in New York in the 1800s? Before Harlem, where did black people live? How free, how educated, how integrated, how prosperous was life? The answers are surprising and personal for our next guest, Carla Peterson. As she began to dig into her own family history, Peterson, a professor at the University of Maryland, wrote the book Black Gotham and is now creating an interactive mobile archive that all of us can use to walk back in time. Carla Peterson joins us via Skype from College Park. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for coming on, and hello from New York. Hello, Brian. It's good to be on. You write that the Harlem model that we think of today was wrong for the 19th century. Where did black New Yorkers live? Well, indeed, I like your use of the phrase Harlem model because it really is a model of what we have in mind um, as what where black New Yorkers lived. Um, but that is a 20th century phenomenon, and the fact is, is that in the 19th century, black, uh, uh, Harlem was a mere village, and uh, blacks did not live there at all. But like all other populations coming into the United, into New York, they started out in Lower Manhattan. So they congregated mainly in Lower Manhattan in an area that was now known as the Five Points, because it was the intersection of five um, streets, and it's about where. Center Street, uh, Leonard Street, Worth Street, uh, Baxter Street are today. Not and far from Chinatown and City Hall. Absolutely, absolutely. And from there, they 
uh, branched out west, um, you know, across uh, uh, West Broadway, Church Street, Greenwich Street, Hudson Street, et cetera, to the Hudson River, and then east towards the East River. And the really interesting thing is that they lived in clusters, um, maybe uh, block by block or within in houses within blocks, but they lived um, in clusters among white people, whether they were newly arrived Irish um, or German immigrants, or whether they were native born who had been there for a while. So that you had a lot more of an integrated neighborhood uh, than you did uh, according to following the Harlem model. But did that go along with an economic integration? Or were the African Americans in New York at that time overwhelmingly poorer than the whites? Uh, of course, they were overwhelmingly poorer than um, the whites. Um, and so there was, one could say that um, there was there was not economic integration since the mass of blacks were poor and lived next to poor Irish um, and poor Germans and so forth. But on the other hand, the group that I talk about, uh, my family was an elite. Uh, and they were not, they of course never had the kind of money that the Astors and others had, um, but they did gain, they did uh, have money. Um, but it was hard for outsiders really to distinguish them from the mass of other blacks. Within their community, they could very much distinguish themselves um, by virtue um, to a certain extent of money, but much more education uh, um, and elite standing, this kind of idea of social respectability. And your search for black Gotham of the 19th century began with your personal search um, regarding your own genealogy, your own relatives. I was looking before at an obituary of, I think, your great-great-grandfather. Uh, if that's Peter Guignon, absolutely. Yes, so tell us about your own search and how that led you to look at uh, the larger conditions in the city. Yeah, so I'm a professor here at the University of Maryland, and I spe specialize in blacks in the antebellum north. And I've done a lot of work on Philadelphia and on uh, Boston, but much less on New York. And so after I finished my last book, somebody said, why don't you write a book about your family? And I demurred, but then I said, sure, which was a little bit of a crazy thing to do because I really had nothing. I had the name of my great grandfather, which was Philip Augustus White, um, but that was about it. I didn't know anything about my family. And so I trudged up to New York and uh, spent a lot of time digging around in the archives. And it was at the Schomburg that I came across um, what you're showing now, which is a scrapbook page uh, torn from an identified scrapbook uh, located in the Rhoda. Golden Freeman collection um, at the Schomburg. Uh, and I was only I be able to identify Peter Guignon because on the page before, I come across the obituary of Philip White, who had, I uh, and uh, Pete, in the Peter Guignon's obituary, it says that, that um, Philip White married his one and only daughter, Elizabeth. And I, all of a sudden then, I found my great, great grandfather. So your great-grandfather and his father-in-law. And how elite were they? When you talk about them being part of a black elite at that time, what did they do? And where did that put them in black society? Where did that put them in uh, New York society across racial lines? OK, so they all started very poor backgrounds. So that was true of all members of the black elite. They came with nothing. Uh, most of the, very often it was a, white father and a black mother and the, uh, the white father had disappeared. That's not the case with Philip White, whose um, father was from northern um, England and was very much present um, in his life. But they really had nothing. And it was education, 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 education. So the famous school um, at the time was called the Mulberry Street School. And it was sponsored by the Manumission Society, the New York Manumission Society, and gave really a pretty good education to black youth at the time. And based on that and hard work um, and the desire to succeed, uh, the black elite managed slowly and painfully 
to crawl up the socioeconomic um, uh, ladder. So interestingly enough, both my great-great-grandfather and my great-grandfather were pharmacists. Uh, James McCune Smith was a doctor. There were, of course, several teachers. There were ministers and so forth. What distinguished them was, that was then their education, their literacy, uh, stable employment, and also this sense of kind of um, the development of moral character. Character was such a big word at the period. Also of respectability. Um, and that's what really constituted um, uh, somebody as elite. Uh, making money, this is New York, so of course, make as much money as you can. Um, and in terms of the, well, the white elite, there was indeed a certain amount of interaction. So one of the really interesting stories I found was that of my, of Peter Guignon's uh, second father-in-law, I'll leave it at that, a man by the name of um, Peter Ray, who started out at the age of 11 as an errand boy in the Lorillard Tobacco Factory and ended up um, at age, uh, in 1882, as the superintendent of the New Jersey, of the, of the new factory in Jersey City. And he was valued by the Lorillards because he was so good at what he did. He was a great judge of leaf tobacco, what was best for cutting, for chewing, for making snuff, et cetera, et cetera. What was the relationship of people in that strata of uh, the black community to the rest of the community. This was decades before Du Bois' idea of the talented 10th, quote unquote, and their responsibilities uh, socioeconomically down the chain to the rest of the community. Was there talk about that and was there a certain kind of relationship? Absolutely. Um, we all think it starts with Du Bois and the talented 10th, not at all. The idea was very much in place from maybe the 1820s or 1830s on, and it was called racial uplift or elevation of the race. And the really what I think is so interesting is that racial uplift applied to those who were less educated, had, had less money, did not have um, uh, skills, but it applied to the black elite as well. There was always room for self-improvement and the black elite was never willing to rest and say, well, we have achieved, so let's just raise those who are, who are lower than us. And it was all about education. Um, we need to educate every member in the community that we can. By the way, I see that your own research also turned up uh, at least one family scoundrel. Uh, James Hewlett, <laughs> your great, great, great uncle, drummed Abs out of the family? Absolutely. And um, so there he is. Um, uh, he, he became an actor. And there was an African-American theater on Mercer, on Mercer Street, the African Grove Theater, uh, run by a man by the name of William uh, Brown. And uh, my great great grand uh, great great James Hewlett, I'll leave it at that, um, uh, played the roles of Othello and Richard the Third, and so forth. And uh, Br William Brown was very um, determined. He knew a lot about publicity, and he really wanted a bigger public. And so he really went after white customers, and it succeeded in getting the white customers away from other um, uh, white theaters. And so there was a riot in the early 1820s, and uh, a big, big mess. And James Hewlett was involved in that, and then in all kinds of other things. But being an actor, my family considered very, very um, um, not respectable. And so they drummed him out of the family. For being an actor, a Shakespearean actor, no exactly. less. Uh, exactly. Shakespeare will come up later in the show again, I believe, on our baseball segment. And enough said about that for the moment. But before you go, just tell us about the app. This is something that people can use to do what? Discover their own family histories or just take themselves on a tour of black New York of the 19th, uh, 19th century? Uh, much more the latter. So I am in the process of, um, of putting together a digital archive and it will have a lot of material based on, my, on Black Gotham, my book. Um, and it'll be kind of a digital version of my book with a lot more images. 
Um, and a lot of information, and one of them indeed will be a walking tour uh, with a smartphone um, and apps as well. But the thing that I really want to do is turn my readers or viewers into writers themselves. And so find a way, once my digital archive is up, is to have my readers, viewers, contribute their own Black Gotham stories to the digital archive and also to create apps also um, in the walking tour that can be added on. Sounds like great fun. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, you know about the High Line. Doubtless you have strolled along that wonderful elevated park on the Lower West Side. But will there be a low line to underground? That's next. I look up to a lot of the older heads, you know, the, the innovators, the heads of the art movements of the past. They kept it really edgy and like a lot of the Latin American muralists and Latin American artists and um, their styles are very unique and new to their time. You know, somewhat controversial, but that's who I look up to mainly. Personally, I'm very excited about going to college. It's something new and it's something different than what I'm used to. I'm definitely going to be a little out of my element, but um, that's what makes it so exciting is that, you know, it's something fresh. Well, there's so many opportunities that I think I could miss out on if I didn't go, you know? Getting into college takes planning and vision. You know, it's just like when I take a brick wall and turn it into a canvas for my art. Paintings help me realize that I've got what it takes. Flip six stairs takes determination. So will getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. In New York City, the past is right under our feet. Our next guest would like to not only preserve that past, but also embrace the future with a new high-tech green space in what was formerly a trolley terminal at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge. Here to highlight the low-line park proposal called Delancey Underground is co-founder Daniel Barish. Hi there. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. So what's there now? So the site we are looking at is an abandoned trolley terminal. And it was built in 1903, around the time when the Williamsburg Bridge was built. And it hasn't been touched since 1948. So we got a visit underground, and what we saw are the remnants of a trolley terminal built at the turn of the century. Now when I think of trolley cars, they're running at surface level. Why is this underground? So our understanding is that the trolley cars deposited uh, passengers uh, coming from Brooklyn into Manhattan right at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge and then the trolley cars would go underground uh, to be serviced and, and turn around and then go right back over the bridge. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, to our understanding, passengers didn't use the underground space uh, it was really simply a streetcar depot. And so you're trying to do what with it? Well, our vision is to uh, transform this space into a beautiful underground park uh, using a new form of solar technology that uh, channels sunlight and reflects natural sunlight below ground at, at intensity that supports photosynthesis. And this is an envisioning of it that we're seeing on the screen now? That's right. Uh, our, our vision uh, imagines an underground space in which uh, sunlight is, is brought underground in a, a visually stunning way uh, and uh, it, the inclusion of some beautiful elements like plants and trees and grasses as well as really creating an experience that some have compared to the High Line uh, in the sense that it could potentially be a, a beautiful transit corridor and an amenity for the neighborhood and the community. Talk about this slide that's up right now. <laughs> so here you have uh, a, a few kids who are uh, enjoying kind of a tranquil moment here in the underground. Uh, there are a couple of elements here that uh, might be helpful to imagine. So you might imagine what's happening above ground. Uh, it may actually be freezing cold and it could be February. 
uh, but it is a nice, beautiful, sunny day, so the sunlight is streaming in. Uh, one of the things that we've heard uh, many times in asking the Lower East Side community around uh, if we had the opportunity for a new open space, the Lower East Side is actually uh, lacking in community space, uh, what would the community use this space for? And one of the things we keep hearing are uh, that young people would really benefit from having something like this uh, a few blocks away from where they go to school and, and live. So we know that there's a high school that's just a few blocks away that actually doesn't have a playground for kids to play on. And so uh, it could actually be uh, the opportunity for parents to bring their kids to a place that is, is fun, is in, in engaging, and also hopefully a really uh, exciting symbol of the potential of new technologies. So it's underground, so it would be warm and protected from the elements as you described. But what makes it a green space? You said trees. Could trees actually grow underground? Right. So the solar technology that we are exploring here uh, actually would reflect sunlight below ground at an intensity that is strong enough to support photosynthesis. So uh, certainly nothing replaces on a beautiful sunny day being outside. Uh, but uh, I think what this would do is it reflects sunlight uh, using a system of fiber optics uh, that reflects that light uh, rather efficiently. That's but what we're seeing here represented? Exactly, exactly. So you would imagine that at street level, we would have some hopefully very beautiful solar collectors uh, that would reflect that light, focus it to one specific point, and then simply reflect that using a system of mirrors uh, below ground. Uh, and then the inverse would happen below ground. So you would have in the ceiling uh, of this space some reflective surfaces that would generate uh, some really beautiful light and hopefully uh, integrate uh, um, into the design in a really compelling way. Would you also generate excess solar energy that you could sell to Con Ed? <laughs> that sounds fantastic, uh, but I don't know that this is actually uh, an energy project. This is really uh, focusing on um, uh, daylighting, which is certainly an industry that uh, exists uh, outside of you know this particular innovation. And we're back inside with the next slide. Really looks like a park here. Well, and yes, the tracks. <laughs> right. So uh, again, sort of some of the features that you can you can see here involve the introduction of uh, some beautiful design elements that play with some of the uh, the, the remnant elements. As as you uh, asked earlier, uh, what exists underground are uh, some uh, some remnant cobblestones, some Belgian blocks that were literally placed there, you know, in the earliest uh, parts of the 20th century. Uh, and they're still there. They haven't been touched, and there are still sort of rail lines. There's still these uh, elevated ceilings and uh, uh, sort of these rusty columns. And for the urban explorer, it's a really exciting environment. So in the same way that the High Line and, and other spaces in the city sort of really pay homage to the history of what that site really was, uh, this would uh, really be an opportunity for us to integrate some beautiful, dynamic, new design uh, with uh, some of the older design uh, uh, in, in a sort of a history meets modern kind of way. And you would leave the tracks in place and that's part of the analogy with the high line. It's an acre, is that right? It's one and a half acres, it's 60,000 square feet. So, which is less than a square block, so that's something by New York City standards. It's not Central Park. <laughs> it's definitely not Central Park, but you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a little bit smaller than parks like Gramercy Park. And, you know, I think in, in New York City, we'll take everything that we can get. And I know that um, uh, what's happening actually in this neighborhood, and this is an important element, is that uh, it actually is one of the largest urban redevelopment areas in the entire um, sort of, uh, basically in all of Manhattan, south of 125th Street. Uh, and uh, in all of the planning uh, that, is, that is really going into this, uh, there isn't really a lot of open space planned. You know, the community has agreed upon uh, what will be happening there. And uh, open space is not necessarily uh, a big part of that uh, uh, redevelopment zone. So we do actually think that we have something to contribute to this community. And actually, I think we have uh, a unique political uh, environment to potentially make it happen. Now, you've been very successful on the crowdfunding site Kickstarter. I gather you've raised $150,000 and like regular folks' donations toward the project. Congratulations on the popularity well, of it. Um, but that doesn't <coughs> guarantee that this is going to go forward. Who owns this space again? So uh, the, uh, the city owns the space, and the MTA holds a master lease to, to this location. The MTA, uh, we expect, will submit um, a request for proposals later on this year, again, in tandem with some of the redevelopment planning happening above ground. So uh, what are the next few steps for us as we uh, hopefully create a sense of inevitability around this project? 
But I think more importantly, how do we come back to the MTA and the city with a business model that makes sense? Um, we are, are working with uh, HRNA, with, with Arup, uh, some of the, the world's best uh, experts in engineering and land use. And architecture, right. And our, our, our hope is that what we can uh, do alongside you know, these experts is come back to the table with some very, very real concrete numbers and plans. So, for example, exactly how much will this cost? Exactly, more importantly, what will be the benefits to the community? You know, by, by some accounts, the High Line has been able to say uh, that even in its short existence, you know, it, it, it cost roughly $150 million to build, but it generated $2 billion in retail and real estate value for the west side of Manhattan. So the question is, what are those numbers, for, you know, in, in our case, on the Lower East Side, in a neighborhood that desperately needs this, and in a neighborhood where the community very much is, is signaling its support? How much would it cost the city or the MTA? <laughs> Again, uh, we're uh, engaging in really robust engineering and, and land use uh, uh, research to, to arrive at a real number. You know, I think it's fair to say that it will uh, be significantly less than the High Line, uh, uh, but will definitely be many millions of dollars. And are you a business or a nonprofit? We are incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so um, we are accepting tax deductible donations. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck. It sounds like a good space if it comes to fruition. Thank you very, very much. Thanks very much. Up next, ex Yankee Jim Bouton on how to be a really obnoxious fan. <laughs> When you earn your GED diploma, the barriers in your life fall. Take the first step and get free GED information in your area at 1-877-38-YOUR-GED or yourged.org. Earn your GED diploma and begin your brighter future. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Well, baseball season is underway. Yippee! I go to some games, and when I do, I always wonder if the players actually hear or pay attention to the insults hurled at them from the stands. You know, it's a baseball tradition to express one's feelings about the opposing players and even your own players when they perform badly. Former Yankee all-star pitcher Jim Bouton understands baseball etiquette. He's the author of the bestseller Ball Four, which is now available in digital form and in audio. And Jim joins us by a phone from his home in the Berkshire Mountains. Hi, Jim. Happy baseball season. Same to you, Brian. So let's talk about you as a fan. You were a kid growing up in New Jersey. Did you root for the Yankees? No. Uh, it was a blue-collar town, and in Rochelle Park, you either rooted for the Dodgers or the Giants. Yankee fans, we figured, were uh, kids who lived in, a, in another town, a better town, were the sons of bankers. We were, we, were, you know, we were Giants fans and Dodger fans. So even then... The Yankees were General Motors. Yeah, like rooting for U.S. Steel, somebody once said. Did you hear as a Giants fan the shot heard round the world, the famous Bobby Thompson, Giants win the pennant home run in 1951? Are you kidding? I know that whole thing. Bobby Thompson hits into the lower deck of the left field stands, and they're going crazy. Yes, I saw it. I had just gotten home from school, rushed into the house. My mom was ironing. Um, she didn't have the game on. I said, Mom, how can you not have the game on? Turned on the game, saw Bobby Thompson's uh, home run, and the minute he hit it, I ran out of the house. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Robert Ariana's house. Robert Ariana was a friend of mine. He was a diehard Dodger fan. We were always arguing over who was better, you know, Duke Snyder or Willie Mays, you know, Pee Wee Reese or Alvin Dark. So uh, we, and we, I hated the Dodgers, and he hated the Giants, but now... I had to go taunt him and razz him. So I ran all the way. It was about a mile and a half. Um, it's about as big as Rochelle Park is. I, I ran all the way. When I got to the house, the, uh, the uh, drapes were, were closed, and I, I 
rang the doorbell, rang the doorbell, rang, knocked on the door. Finally, his mother came to the door, and I said, is Robert home? He said, Robert's not feeling well. <laughs> and you knew why. <laughs> Did... And he didn't come to school for a week. <laughs> yes, the attachments we have to our teams and the humiliation um, by uh, extension and association that we experienced. Did you go to games as a kid? And if you did, did you razz? Did you boo? No, we didn't. I, you know, to me, it's a, just walking into the polo grounds was like a religious experience. It was like a cathedral. It was. We, we'd get there very early before the game. We'd camp out above the Chesterfield pack in left field and uh, and hope that, uh, you know, one of the Giants or, or Bob Elliott or some of those guys who could really hit the ball from the visiting team would hit a ball up in the stands and we could we could get it. We even we even brought a, uh, a fishing net with us on a long pole. We snuck it into the into the ballpark and we <laughs> we had practiced in front of our house catching long fly balls with this fishing net, but uh, we weren't able to catch any balls. No, we loved it. We loved uh, we loved going to the Polo Grounds. And when the Dodge when the Giants moved to um, I'm sorry, when we moved to Chicago, we went to uh, watch the games in the Wrigley Field. I remember um, going down to the Dodger, uh, to the Giants dugout, and I uh, wanted to let them know that, uh, you know, hey, there was somebody here from New York, and we were Giants fans, and, you know, we're rooting for you. And Alvin Dark looked up to me, and he says, take a hike, kid. <laughs> Aww. And my brother says, what did he say? He said, Alvin Dark told me to take a hike. And we got home. That was the biggest thrill of the day. Hey, Dad, guess what? Alvin Dark told Jim to take a hike. <laughs> so the, in that case, the manager was, or the players were heckling the fans instead of the fans heckling the players. Right. Um, did you hear the boos? Did you hear the heckling when fans would get on you when you were a pitcher? Oh, yeah. I loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I got a big kick out of it, particularly in Boston. The Boston fans are, are uh, wow, I mean, they really, they, it sounds like it's like pitching in the Roman Coliseum with the, in, in Fenway Park, Fenway Pack. Fenway, Fenway Pack. Was that a particularly enlightened attitude toward the booing? Did it get on other guys more and get under their skin? No, not really, um, because, you know, you got that all over the place. Uh, most of the guys just, you know, blocked it out. Uh, and I blocked it out after a while just because it was, you know, I didn't want it to interfere with my, con con you know, from my concentration. But, um, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I liked it in the beginning. I liked hearing what they had to say and the screaming things at you. I got a big kick out of it. Do you have any advice for the baseball fans in our audience about how to be better hecklers? Uh, well, <laughs> I read a, uh, some guy wrote a book and he was explaining exactly how fans could be better hecklers, and one of the things was to uh, that, that you should know the the minor league team, the top, the triple A team of whatever team you're rooting against, and then when when a player comes up to bat and you holler out, you know, uh, Des Moines. <laughs> so, so he's thinking of it. If he doesn't get a hit, he's going to go down to Des Moines. Schenectady, Birmingham. Right. <laughs> I gather it's hard for Yankee fans to do that this year because the Yankees. Triple A team, if I have this right, is homeless. So they're playing games uh, in this city and that city and the other city. That must be a bizarre experience for a kid coming up trying to make the majors. Uh, well, yeah, I guess so. I never had that experience before. But, uh, you know, the worst thing is going from one minor league team to another minor league team to another minor league team. I know this guy who's, who, who spent a whole summer playing on four or five different minor league teams. Mm. Tell us about your idea for putting a fan on the field. Well, I was always thinking about how fans really want to influence the game. You know, they, 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 they holler things. They, they, they try to reach for a ball. If, if the opposing team is trying to catch the ball, they, they try to jostle them. You know, they're, they, they, they're dying to, to, to have some influence. Um, and so I thought that they ought to have something called, uh, the, you know, wild card fan, where uh, fans would... Uh, if they thought they could, you know, play ball or do a decent job, they would bring their spikes and a glove, and they would uh, fill out a postcard and drop it in a, you know, a canister or something like that. And then they would draw one of these cards during the game, like say the third inning, and then that player would then that fan would then come down onto the field, and they would stick him in, you know, at a, you know, particular. They'd put him in at third or something like that. You wouldn't want him pitching, 
or catching, but, you know, third base. You wouldn't want him at third. That's the hot corner. He'll get his head knocked off by a line drive. <laughs> well, you wouldn't want him at shortstop. You know, there's, you know they would uh, rack him up on a double play or something like that. So, so you stick him in the lineup and, then, and see how he does. And, of course, you know, if he doesn't do well, then, you know, you have police protection for him so he can get, you know, home. So, and the idea is what? The idea is that he would play, you know, for the rest of the game or maybe two or three innings and um, see how he did. All right. Be, but you do this all the time. You're the irregular thing so that uh, when you played that, with the opposing team, when you were in, at their ballpark, that they would have the wild card fan. And that would be a question of which, which team had the best fans, the best, you know, the guys who could play ball. This uh, might work at uh, City Field kind of as well as, well, I don't know, it's David Wright over there, so shouldn't put down the Mets too much. Uh, in fact, did you know that um, I should have a place in the Hall of Shame for being the worst hot dog vendor in the history of Shea Stadium? Uh, this was for Jets games, but somehow I would manage to sell hot dogs for like three hours and come home with maybe $10 in my pocket. I have no idea how I did it. But you also have some thoughts about the noise as we talk about heckling um, from the vendors at the stadiums, right? Yeah, I always enjoyed uh, the different vendors in the different ballparks. They all have a different attitude or a different manner. Uh, in the minor leagues, there was a vendor that I enjoyed listening to. And uh, when he would, uh, he would be selling hot dogs or whatever it was, and he would proceed it with, uh, something that sounded like Shanamagai. Hey, Shanamagai hot dogs. Hey, Shanamagai peanuts. Uh, I don't know what that word was, but, uh, you know, it seemed to work for him. Um, and and uh, I particularly like the New York uh, vendors. Hey, peanuts, how many? You know what I mean? It's like you, you have to get peanuts. It's just a question of uh, the quantity. And then I liked, the, hey, beer here, hey, cold beer. It's like they were threatening you. <laughs> had to buy one of these cold beers. And Fenway Park is always great, you know, once you understood the language. I never uh, got the vendors with a sneer. You know, I get it with the waiters at the Carnegie Deli and that kind of thing, but are they going to sell more beer to you, more peanuts, if they're sneering at you as they walk up and down the aisles, and yet those vendors exist? Well, I never saw, uh, you know, well, I spent most of my time on the field, but uh, when I would go into the stands, um, to me, vendors were always seemed to be having a good time. I mean, you're at a ball game. Uh, your job is to sell food and not block important plays on the field. Not block as much as possible. Maybe that's why I didn't make any money. I was a little too interested in what was going on. <laughs> yeah, you were watching in the game. The game. <laughs> um, tell me on a more... Serious note, Ball 4, among many other things, uh, talked about, let's say, the substance abuse, the juicing of its day, which was mostly alcohol. Um, but today, of course, everybody talks about players and steroids. How would you compare what players took in those days to what they take today? Well, um, I, the, the only drug that we took... Um, was something called uh, pep, greenies, pep pills. And uh, they're, they're the kind of thing you would take if you were going to be, you know, driving late at night or you got a little tired or you wanted to study for an exam or something like that. Amphetamines, familiar with Amphetamines, exactly right. But they didn't make you bigger or stronger or faster. Uh, they're, not, they're not good to take, but they're, they're completely different than steroids. Steroids is another, um, you, you know, a whole other, a whole other animal. Steroids actually increase the, your muscle mass, makes you bigger, stronger, faster, and actually gives you an unfair advantage over, over players who are not taking it. So greenies were performance enablers. They enabled you to play up to your ability. But uh, the steroids were performance enhancers. They made you a different person, and, and they're dangerous. So I think there's a, you know, there's a, a, a very big difference between the, the drugs back then and you know, the amphetamines back then and steroids now. Even that and your stories about players drinking and stuff like that was considered a big scandal at the time. It was kind of a first behind-the-scenes book that came out, written by somebody who was still in the majors at the time. And then I gather that uh, you were subjected to your own heckling once you went back on the mound, not by the fans, but sometimes by other players. Yes. Um, 
I, I don't know if I can t tell you what Pete Rose screamed at me from the Cincinnati dugout. Tell me the FCC-friendly version. <laughs> um, F you, Shakespeare. That's what Rose hollered. Shakespeare. And I thought, yeah, yeah. And I was standing on the mound, and I thought, hey, Pete Rose, a literary reference. That's great. There you go. Did any of the players read the book? Did Mickey Mantle and those guys who you were teammates of and wrote about read the book? No, I don't think so. Most of the guys were not readers. Um, you know, they were you know a little more than high school educated, and uh, and they stayed that way for most of their careers um, because they didn't read. Uh, if, you, if you read a book on a, on a, on a bus or something, then you were nicknamed the professor. I remember one time I was reading a paperback book, and one of my teammates came over to me and he sat down next to me and. He was watching me read, and finally he said, uh, tell me something. I see you're reading a book there. Uh, I see you're reading a lot. He said, uh, does that make you smarter? And he, he really wanted to know. Thanks, Shakespeare. And that's it for this week's show. We roll out a new episode Wednesday nights at 7.30, or see us anytime at cuny.tv. And check out my daily radio show, weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. Tomorrow morning, Gridlock Sam Schwartz on the proper place for trucks on New York City streets. That's on 93.9 FM and AMA 20 WNYC. Talk to you then.